There's still an incredible aura about him. And for a sportsman to have this some 30 years after his retirement, well, it's just fabulous to be remembered like that. In 1957, when I was 11 years old, I saw his style of driving. And even then, this was the greatest motivation for my career. Everybody sort of looked and watched him walk around, you know, rather as if the Pope had arrived. Such is the admiration for the man that he is today revered the world over as one of sport's true living legends. Juan Manuel Fangio of Argentina is now 80 years old and is regarded as the greatest racing driver of all time. Well, a driver isn't born a driver. You become a driver. It depends on the racing background you come from. Today, to be good in Formula One, the majority of drivers have been karting champions. These cars have similar handling to a Formula One car. We didn't have this possibility. We had to adapt the car to the circumstances. Fangio's story began on the 24th of June, 1911, St. John's Day, hence the name Juan. He was born the fourth of six children. His father, Don Loreto, was Italian, the family having emigrated from Chieti in the Italian Abruzzi before the turn of the century. Don Loreto married his 17-year-old childhood sweetheart, Donna Herminia, in 1903, and they moved to the quiet agricultural town of Balcarce, 250 miles south of Buenos Aires. His father was a stonemason, but the young Juan Manuel only had eyes for cars. His early interests lay in all things mechanical. He took an engineering apprenticeship and then worked in a succession of garages. But his ability behind the wheel soon became evident, and it was matched only by his skill as a footballer, his bandy legs earning him the nickname El Chueco. In his early 20s, Fangio thought of moving to Buenos Aires, but he was so popular that his footballing teammates dissuaded him by clubbing together to help start his first garage. It was then that he began to take racing seriously. His debut in 1936 in a borrowed taxi was unspectacular, but one man who had no doubts about his ability was his mechanic and brother, Toto. Something about him told us he was going to be good. He had a knack, or, or rather a gift, that made him the fastest kid on the block. Everything he did, he did well. His first victory came in 1940, when he drove a Chevrolet in the Gran Premio Internacional del Norte. This was a grueling 6,000-mile race on rough, unsurfaced roads across the Andes from Buenos Aires to Bolivia, Peru, and back. Here, strength, ingenuity, and stamina were the qualities required to get to the finish. We didn't have any backup or anything. We carried everything in the car so as to be able to repair any damage that occurred. But what was essential was to prepare the car very well. I never look for speed, I look for reliability. But in 1948, Fangio's career suffered a tragic blow. While driving in the Gran Premio de la América del Sur in Peru, he crashed his Chevrolet. Fangio was only slightly injured, but his co-driver, Daniel Urrutia, was killed. Fangio was stricken with grief at the death of his friend. It was my first accident, and I didn't think I could race again. Because when you have an accident, you realize you're mortal. It could have happened to him, or it could have happened to me. I talked with his family. It was they who persuaded me to continue racing. 
After three months out of racing, Fangio was offered a chance by the Argentine Automobile Club to compete against the top Europeans, such as Villoresi, Ascari and Farina, in a series of races in Argentina. Fangio was already 37, but it was in a race at Mar del Plata driving a Maserati that he finally attained international recognition. On the two and a half mile circuit around the famous resort, Fangio in car number 24 surprised all the established drivers. His smooth and precise technique that was to prove his hallmark in later years was evident and he dominated from start to finish. His victory was greeted by more than 300,000 Argentinians, including many from his hometown, Balcarce. Juan Manuel Fangio had arrived. We were so confident he was going to win that race. The whole of Balcarce went to see him, and he won. He led from start to finish. No one could overtake him. Fangio has always been a popular figure in Balcarce, where he's lived for almost his entire life. The family home has remained in the Fangio name for almost a century. Well, we keep it going because this was where we were all born. My father started when he got married with one room, and there are memories of him here that we can't forget. A big Sunday lunch is a tradition in the family. The house is open to relatives and friends, and according to his niece, so many come because of their love and respect for Fangio. Even my grandparents went to him for advice, because he was so balanced, so patient and understanding towards everyone. He's been the family father figure throughout his entire life. His success in Mar del Plata in 1949 was to prove the springboard for greater triumphs away from South America. That same year, Fangio was offered a drive on the prestigious European tour. He won his first race at San Remo easily. Throughout that summer, he took on and vanquished Europe's best drivers in their own backyard. By the end of the season, he'd won six European races. He even triumphed in Perpignan against the already legendary Prince Bira. His success was such that on his return to Argentina in August, he was greeted with a hero's welcome. It was to be the first of many. Fangio's achievement couldn't have come at a better time, for in 1950 he was signed to drive for the world's best team, Alfa Romeo, in the inaugural Drivers World Championship. The team comprised Giuseppe Farina, Luigi Fagioli, and Fangio. They became known as the three Fs. He made an immediate impression. At the Monaco Grand Prix, he miraculously avoided a first lap pileup that eliminated most of the field, and he went on to win. He followed this with Grand Prix victories in both Belgium and here in France. In that first year, only six Grand Prix were held and the Alfa Romeos were unbeatable. Fangio entered the last race in Monza, Italy as championship leader ahead of Fagioli and Farina. But despite starting in pole position, this was not to be Fangio's day. He was forced to retire with a broken valve, handing both race and championship to Farina. However, Fangio's fight for the world championship had galvanized a nation. Such was his popularity in Argentina that a song had been written about his triumphs in Europe. It too was a huge success at the time.
The nation's biggest sporting hero was greeted by Juan and Eva Perón. And his parents. Fangio remained with Alfa Romeo for the 1951 season. He was favorite to take the title that had so narrowly eluded him the year before. In France, as this rare color film shows, he had a narrow escape having to avoid a rival in trouble. But Fangio's red Alfa Romeo was dominant and he clinched his second win in the season's third Grand Prix. Alfa Romeo had won every race in which they'd entered for five years. In the final race of the season, Fangio took the honors and became world champion for the first time. That victory in Spain was Fangio's last for Alfa Romeo, who later withdrew from Grand Prix racing, sensing that there would be no opposition to the improving Ferraris. In 1952, Fangio had an unsuccessful season with BRM, culminating in an accident which would put him out of racing for seven months. In June, having retired from a race in Northern Ireland, Fangio drove through the night to Italy to fulfill an engagement with Maserati at Monza. Thoroughly exhausted, he arrived at two o'clock, the race started at 2.30, and by 3 he was in hospital, having lost control and crashed. The injury to his neck proved the most serious of his career. When I regained consciousness, all I wanted to do was to get back on the track, because I knew it was me who'd made the mistake. His appetite for racing was undiminished when he returned, and the following year at Monza he secured one of his finest victories. He and compatriot Onofre Marimon in the Maseratis fought a ferocious duel with the all-conquering Ferraris of Ascari and Farina. But a spin on the very last corner of the final lap eliminated his rivals, handing victory to a grateful Fangio. In 1954, the Mercedes-Benz team, who were making a return to the track under the wily stewardship of Alfred Neubauer, signed Fangio. It was to be a combination that would dominate motor racing for the next two seasons. Fangio and his new teammate, the German Karl Kling, unveiled the distinctive W196 Silver Arrow cars for their debut at the French Grand Prix. The Silver Arrows simply drove away from the opposition. Such was his dominance that year that by the time of the last Grand Prix in Italy, El Chueco's second world championship was assured. At Monza, he gained his sixth victory of the season. No other driver achieved more than one. For the 1955 season, Mercedes started without the aerodynamic bodywork for the Silver Arrows. By now, Fangio had a new teammate, an Englishman, Sterling Moss, who was 19 years his junior. The two, driving in tandem, pupil following master, so dominated the season that they became known as the train, winning five Grand Prix between them. One of the greatest races between the two came that year on Moss's home soil, the British Grand Prix at Aintree. For lap after lap, they fought each other for the lead. It was to be a classic. For once, Moss won. Although by finishing second, Fangio retained the world championship anyway. But in that year, motor racing's blackest day precipitated the end of this golden partnership. At Le Mans, in the famous 24-hour race, Mercedes entered a four-car assault on the most prestigious of endurance events. Le 
Levey's Mercedes hit Macklin's Austin Healey and catapulted into the grandstand, killing Levey and 90 spectators. The accident happened in front of me. The road was blocked and I held firmly onto the wheel, expecting the crash. I overtook Macklin's car. I didn't feel that I'd hit him, but his car smashed into the pits, killing people. Astonishingly, the race wasn't stopped, but Mercedes withdrew as a gesture of respect, with Moss and Fangio leading. For Mercedes in particular, and the sport in general, it was to be the end of an era. Following the deaths earlier in the season of Ascari and Vukovic, Grand Prix races were cancelled, and Mercedes withdrew from competition at the end of the year. At the wheel of the W196 Silver Arrow, Fangio had started 12 Grand Prix, winning eight and claiming two world championships. To this day, Fangio retains the closest of links with both Mercedes and his good friend Sterling Moss. For both men, a recent opportunity to drive around the Hockenheim track in the cars in which they're best remembered is a chance to relive past glories. Many regard Moss as the best driver never to become world champion. The reason was Fangio. He was the greatest team leader that I've ever been with, obviously, because he's the greatest driver in the world. But uh, more than that, he was a very wonderful man to follow. I mean, he used to follow him very closely. And uh, he would never go over the side and throw the dirt in my way. He'd always position his car as it should be correctly. And uh, it was just a fantastic experience to drive alongside and with somebody as good as that. In his career, Fangio raced all over the world. But it was on a visit to Cuba that a most extraordinary event took place. He was kidnapped as a publicity stunt by Fidel Castro's supporters. And it was to prove a blessing in disguise. I asked the people who kidnapped me what their reason was. And they told me, we are fighting for a cause, we don't want a dictatorship. They believed that Batista was a dictator, so they kidnapped me so that I couldn't compete and said they'd release me at one o'clock Monday morning after the race. I told them I believed in destiny. At worst, you people have probably done me a favor by kidnapping me, I said. And true enough, on the sixth lap, there was a very bad accident. A lot of people died, and the race had to be abandoned. 1956 was to prove the most difficult of years. Argentina had been thrown into political turmoil after the fall of Peron. The new regime of General Aramburu set up an investigative body to examine personalities linked to the Peron regime. This included Fangio, who was told not to leave the country. The government later relented because of Fangio's fame and popularity and because he'd been invited to drive for Ferrari that season. And in Monaco, he demonstrated that despite off-track pressures, his skill behind the wheel remained unimpaired. But it was around the winding streets of the Principality that Fangio drove one of his most uncharacteristic races. After losing time following a second lap crash, he hounded the leader until colliding again. This time he took over teammate Collins' car and relinquishing his normal smooth and precise technique in favor of raw aggression, he closed on leader Moss's Maserati. But for once, the master was unable to unseat the younger man. Fangio, however, was still the driver to beat. That season, at the wheel of the Lancia Ferrari, he won in Argentina, Britain, and here in Germany to seal his third consecutive world championship. But a rift between Fangio and team boss Enzo Ferrari meant an abrupt end to this partnership. By 1957, Monaco at Grand Prix time was firmly established as the playground for the rich and famous. By now, Fangio was 45, but still capable of doing battle with the new wave of up-and-coming English drivers around the streets of Monte Carlo. Following his difficulties with Ferrari, Fangio had moved to the Maserati team and was embarking upon what was probably his finest season. Moss, 
Ross in a green van wall took an immediate lead, followed by Collins and Hawthorne in their Lancia Ferraris, with Fangio lying in fourth place. But a three-car pileup eliminated the leaders, allowing Fangio to take an easy victory. Following his wins in Argentina and subsequently in France, he was once more in a dominant championship position. But it was at the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring that summer that Fangio drove what is still regarded as his greatest race. After beating the lap record in practice, he gambled by starting the race on half tanks and softer tyres in a bid to build up an early lead. On lap 12, with a 28-second lead, he came into the pits. The stop was a disaster. Instead of taking 30 seconds, Fangio emerged 48 seconds behind the Ferraris of Hawthorne and Collins with just 10 laps remaining. All chance of victory seemed lost, but this was just the cue for an amazing pursuit. His Maserati handling to perfection, Fangio hounded the two Ferraris, shattering the lap record again, this time by 25 and a half seconds. Two laps from the end, he was on the leader's trail, taking the lead on the penultimate lap, snatching victory before an ecstatic crowd. A victory that clinched the World Championship. But his greatest triumph was also to be his last. He returned to Argentina once more a hero. But just 10 months later, aged 47, he retired. In a career spanning 51 Championship Grand Prix, Fangio won very nearly half of his races. Even the greatest drivers of today average only one win every four Grand Prix. In his home country, his name is still synonymous with motor racing. And he's honorary president of Mercedes-Benz Argentina. As a tribute from the townspeople of Balcarce, a museum has been built in his name. I wasn't thinking of anything big. So when a group of friends from Balcarce realized I was going to donate everything of mine to pay them back a little for the many, many things that they'd given me, we decided to set up a museum in my town. Pride of place in the museum goes to the Mercedes W196, which Fangio drove to his 1954 and 1955 titles. His total of five world championships remains unsurpassed to this day. Fangio has a unique position in the pantheon of the gods of motor racing, still admired by the heroes of today. Over the course of his career, he established himself as the greatest driver in the history of motor racing. And even today, he remains a great idol for all the drivers. But above everything else, he remains a great man. Racing is just a stage in life. You can't just live off memories. If it weren't for my friends, I would never have succeeded at anything. I don't know what I would have done if I'd not taken up racing. Perhaps my life might have been shorter if I'd continued with bad adventures along a path where one should never go. That's why I love this profession so much. Con esa mano maestra, ¿quién te 